Okay, um, sorry to have to bring you into the classroom on a Saturday morning. <laughs> there should be a, a time for a good rest. But because of my schedule, I have to put it on uh, Saturday. And so I work for the government now. So previously, I worked as a professor at the General Normal University, where you stay for... You're going to stay there for three weeks? One more week. One Oh, great. So also the Beijing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the very highlight of it. Um, I worked in that university for 25 years, but now I'm associated with uh, the provincial department of foreign affairs. But I'm still doing my research in the internationalization of higher education, which is my field of uh, uh, study as a student. Um, so what I'm going to share with you is um, some general patterns and the trends of internationalization of higher education. Okay, I think uh, the reason why we're here is because of this. Okay, wouldn't, we wouldn't have been here without you know, the, the process of internationalization of higher education. So what I'm going to do today, um, the first, okay, we're going to look at how the discourse has been changing because it very much reflects the landscape of uh, internationalization in education. And then we'll look at some main patterns and some possible trends uh, in that topic. The change in discourse? Well, you know, as brothers, of course, you know what. Uh, we experienced in the 60s, in the 70s, and in the early 70s. You know, we had um, the Cultural Revolution, right? I guess you understand that. Um, beginning from the late 60s to the late 70s, <coughs> China isolated itself from the rest of the world. Okay? There's no you know, connections with other countries around the world. Uh, completely isolated, uh, you know. Uh, so during that time, of course, originally we had some exchanges with countries worldwide, but because of this cut, okay, uh, you know, almost all the educational exchanges with foreign countries, uh, you know, were terminated. We terminated. We have much focus on the cultural revolution inside the country to break down the so-called you know, uh, you know, traditions. So this is why, you know, in a city, historical city of Hangzhou, Hangzhou has a city, a city a history of more than 2,000 years. But uh, when you say, when you see it, you come up with uh, not much old houses, okay? Uh, we have some temples, some streets, but the majority of them were destroyed in the Cultural Revolution, which of course is uh, big tragedy. Uh, but uh, at the end of the 1970s, when Deng Xiaoping took power, they decided to open up to the world again by introducing the reform and opening up scheme. We call it reform and open up. So that was initiated in 1978. But at that time, uh, you know, after some you know, uh, 10 years of suspension, everything has to be re-started. Uh, you know, so at the very beginning of that process, uh, only you know, a very few elite, elite universities were eligible to that, like Beijing University, Peking University, Tsinghua University, and in this province is very much the Zhejiang University. Uh, they were authorized to do exchanges uh, you know, with uh, foreign education institutions with you know, uh, governments uh, from you know, different parts of the world. Uh, but during that period, you know, they only had a small branch of foreign affairs office. So even within the university, they have the foreign affairs office, which is regarded as an extension of the national diplomacy. Okay? So it's very much... Uh, you know, not as integrated as we have today. 
okay, foreign affairs of this. In a foreign, uh, in a, by the word foreign, it is not very much central to the university function. Okay, so foreign affairs. So uh, only the elite universities have the branch called the foreign affairs of office. But uh, with the further opening up and development in China in the 1990s, so almost all the universities were encouraged to have this kind of development or the expansion of the international dimensions, how they should be better integrated into the world academic system, how they need to think about uh, developing their capacity through international cooperation. So the Ministry of Education actually changed its name of a division of foreign affairs to a division of international cooperation and exchange. So previously, without, within the structure, the administrative structure of the Ministry of Education, there was a division or a department of foreign affairs. But in the 90s, it was changed to uh, the Department for International Cooperation and Exchange, which of course very much reflects the government mindset for that. It is no longer regarded as a part of foreign affairs, but as an integral part of a university, okay? especially in relation to its three main functions, teaching, research, and services. So they should be integrated into these three dimensions of a university. So it's now taking part as part of the university uh, you know, function. But again, this changed ever since the year 2000. Okay. Actually, China became part, was regained into the World Trade Organization in the year 2001. And even within the government policies, we start to use the word internationalization. But before that, in the government documents, very rarely uh, do we use the word internationalization. But what, by, what do we mean by internationalization? What do we have to use the word internationalization in official document? First, it reflects a very proactive attitude. Okay? Um, you know, especially, you know, um, when you know, the universities have to be made more responsive to the economic and the societal demands. So the talents that are the, or the human resources that have been prepared by the universities have to have the ability to work internationally or to work in any international environment, especially you know, uh, when China comes to the period we have more investment abroad. So we need to support such development by cultivating uh, the competent uh, you know, talents. Okay? And uh, secondly, for education itself, you know, uh, China realized the importance of you know, uh, strengthening the reform through opening up. So educational opening up is regarded as a very important driving force or catalyst to the modernization of education in this society. Okay? So the attitude changed. And also, you know, in the ninety in the late nineteen nineties, you know, when the university was still very much of an elite nature. Okay? So in order to bring education into the overall economic you know, framework. So by the end of the 1990s, education was also used as a tool for economic policies. Very interesting. You know, at that time, not many people are spending money, were spending money. So the central government said, well, maybe this is also a good way to stimulus consumption. Okay. So in the, nine, in the year 1998, we started the massification process of higher education. i just give you one example. So when I was a university student, only 
point, point, uh, 0.5% of the student age cohort between 19 and 24 were eligible for universities. 0.5. Okay, very, very limited. But, you know, I went to university in early 80s. So 0.5%. By now, because of the massification process, in this province, the students that are eligible to universities is more than 63%, okay, of the age cohort between 19 to 24. Okay, 64, 63%. So you can see that big change. Uh, and of course, in the ninety, in the late ninety, uh, 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 late nineteen nineties, you know, public public universities were even encouraged to run a branch, a private branch within the campus. For example, Zhejiang Normal University. Okay, they opened a college. It's called the Xinzi College, which offered self-supporting programs for students who are required to pay full tuition. Okay, they might feel very short of the matriculation marks, okay, maybe two or three scores, but they have to pay full fee for an additional place in the university. Okay, so a private branch is opened. Uh, uh, first, to prepare the human resources. Second, of course, is the stimulus consumption within the education sector as part of the general economic policy. Okay, and of course, uh, by interna internationalization, we also mean it's not an ad hoc approach, but a holistic, a systematic approach towards that. So you have to plan it, you have to think very carefully how to implement that plan, and you have to integrate the different levels of universities, the higher education sector in that. So it's more like a systematic approach towards uh, you know, internationalization. internationalization. So, um, and almost all the universities uh, have developed certain capacity in that. Okay? They usually have a very well established office for international exchanges and cooperation. In some universities, they also have you know, an office for internationalization. Uh, they use the word internationalization directly. Okay. So this is very much how the word internationalization has come about. So by internationalization, we mean, uh, so an international dimension, a cross-cultural dimension is integrated into the main function of the university, to be simple. Okay, so international dimension or cross-cultural dimension or elements uh, are integrated into the process of teaching, research, and community services, which are regarded as the three main functions of universities. So to be simple, it's like this. But as I said, uh, internationalization of higher education in China is very much you know, approached as a vehicle and a catalyst for higher education modernization. It's a tool. So the purpose is not for internationalization itself, but for modernization. But of course, in the same time, internationalization is a vehicle. It's a testimony of modernization itself. Okay. So first, it's a catalyst, and then it's uh, testimony, it's a vehicle of modernization. It shows the modernized aspect of higher education. Okay. Um, but you know, the approach that we take towards internationalization of higher ed education is quite different from the developed countries, such as the United States, Australia, Canada, Germany, France. Okay. We take it more as a capacity building process, okay? Uh, it is used, it is, you know, uh, adopted mainly to enhance the 
the capacity of teaching and the research and services of the universities. So it's more like a capacity building oriented approach. And of course, uh, also we you know higher uh, human resources. Okay, so the overall approach for uh, internationalization in China is fourfolded. Is fourfold capacity building, human resource development, internet to promote international understanding, and also for economic benefits. Uh, capacity building, of course, it's understandable. China needs to improve the profile of the system of higher education and the institutions themselves in the world academic circle to improve the profile. And secondly, of course, is to improve the standards and the quality of teaching, research, and services through open up, through internationalization. And secondly, as China has a very short history of higher education, and as China is developing so rapidly uh, in terms of economic, economy, uh, uh, you know, social affairs, um, you know, science and technology. So we need to prepare, you know, human resources that can contribute to that. But for some of the fields of studies, we do not have expertise. So by introducing foreign universities to run programs in China, we satisfy part of the demands from our students. Okay, uh, so we, uh, you know, introduced, you know, by great quantity, we call it quality higher education resources. Uh, universities were invited to run joint universities and joint programs in, in, in China. Okay, for example, in this province we have the Ningbo Nottingham University. Ningbo Nottingham University, okay, which is located in Ningbo. They have now more than seven thousand students, which is in their minds, the biggest campus or branch campus you know, in the world. But we do not take it as a branch campus because we do not allow any branch campus. We only allow joint universities. They have to run with a Chinese university. Okay? Uh, so this is just one example. They offer you know, uh, you know, schools of programs. Okay, that are not easily you know, accessible by our traditional Chinese universities. So they come up as a complementary to our university systems by offering <coughs> new fields of studies to our students. So human resource development. International understanding, of course, it's um, a, a traditional approach uh, um, you know, through cultural exchanges, through students Student, student mobilities, uh, faculty mobilities, they can have uh, respect of different cultures and also uh, they, they know exactly how to disseminate values of the traditional society here. So they will come up uh, you know, with opportunities uh, for uh, cross-cultural communications so that they can understand each other better and respect each other better. <coughs> so this is more for the international understanding. Economic benefits, as I said, so the overall, you know, massification of higher education in China is taking as part as the economic policies, the economic, rather than the education policy itself. So there's economic benefits generated from internationalization by recruiting international students, by running joint programs, by offering, you know, uh, places for <laughs> teaching for research inside the universities. Uh, so there's always, you know, an economic benefits associated with that. Okay, uh, this of course is the approach uh, adopted by many developed countries. For example, in the UK, in the uh, in Australia. Okay, they take it as a business, as a service, educational services. Okay.
then you might wonder, you know, what are the main policy areas, you know, if when we talk about internationalization, so then what the Chinese government is thinking about, especially in forging policies, you know, to promote the development of it, what are the policy areas? You know, I try to classify them into three areas. One is uh, student and faculty mobility. Second is program mobility. And the third is institutional mobility. You know, it has something to do with the mobility of knowledge, of services, right? Okay. Uh, but student and faculty mobilities, okay, this, of course, uh, include government scholarships, fellowships, okay, uh, you know, institution-based fellowships. Now our universities are encouraged to develop schemes for their own staff members and faculty members to develop their professional school skills abroad or in collaboration with foreign universities, okay, uh, and also foreign experts and teachers, okay, uh, our universities are authorized to invite foreign teachers uh, on the condition that they meet certain standards. For example, according to our policy, a foreign teacher who wants to who wants to teach in China needs to meet several criteria. First, he or she must have a bachelor's degree and above. Second, he needs to have a professional qualification. Now, for example, he wants to teach uh, English in China, which means then he needs to have a professional certificate of TESOL or TEFL. Okay? Then, at least two years of experience. Okay, that's the third. Four, then he or she will have to be employed or invited <coughs> by an institution. In China. So these are the four prerequisites for a teacher to work, foreign teacher to work in China. So for expert teachers, self-funded study abroad student, you know, the majority, the vast majority of our students study abroad on their own expenses. We call it self-supporting students, okay? Uh, and also uh, international students uh, in China. I'm going to come up uh, with that uh, the international students in here. Okay, actually, uh, Pakistan is uh, one of the largest uh, source countries for international students in China. I think it's the third or the fourth. I'll come up to that later. Okay, <coughs> student and faculty mobility. Okay, uh, when they move, they move with knowledge. They move with ideas. They move up with services. So that's it. And. Program mobility, okay, it relates to courses, to degree programs, exchange programs. Here we have the Sino Foreign Joint Education programs, okay. Uh, foreign exams, for example, TOEFL, IELTS, SAT, okay, ACT, okay, AP, A level, they are all available in China. These programs, these examinations are all available in China, okay? So that the students can take these exams and choose to study in whatever country they would like, okay? Joint research projects, okay? Joint research projects, okay? So this is something to do with the program mobility. Institutional mobility, then it's more comprehensive. Uh, international schools, okay, we have a number of international schools for foreigners. <coughs> Uh, in this city, <coughs> uh, there are quite some, uh, you know, experts, uh, foreign business people living in here. Then they come with their children, so they need to be educated in the international schools. International schools, uh, branch campuses abroad, okay, joint institutions in here. As I said, the Ningbo Nottingham, this is a joint university. <coughs> Confucius Institutes uh, and classrooms abroad. Uh, I understand in Pakistan there are a couple of Confucius Institutes and Confucius classrooms. Okay, 
joint labs and set centers, joint laboratories and joint research centers, research centers, and also agencies of foreign exams and evaluation. Okay, so this, of course, has something to do with the institution and organization. It's not only a program, uh, but an organizing which might have a number of programs. So institutional mobility, mobility is the most comprehensive. It is usually made up of program, program mobility as well as student and faculty mobility. So institutional mobility is a high level okay, of these three types of mobility. Okay, this three mobility. So these are the general policy areas of internationalization of higher education in China. And then out this, I hope this uh, introduction uh, will help you to have a general picture of why we are doing that. Okay, um, what has been changing in this course? And what are the main policy areas uh, of internationalization of higher education? So next, I would like to come up with some policy, some statistics, statistics, uh, statistics and on some new developments as a result of the policy implementation. Um, the very first important pattern here is we have very high level institutional design for internationalization of higher education. So these two documents were actually, are actually the most important documents in terms of internationalization of higher education, the most recent ones. They were both released in 2016. Okay? The first one is some opinions on strengthening education open up in the new era. So this was actually released by the General Office of the State Council and the General Office of the CPC Central Committee. And never a document in the education open up was released by that high level. That's the very highest level in China. Okay, and they use the term some opinions. It's not said regulations, opinions. So that it provides a guidelines for different provinces, for universities or institutions to follow. Okay, uh, to uh, some opinions on strengthening education open in the new era. Okay, and the second one relates to the One Belt and One Road Initiative. It is one of the biggest opening up uh, you know, initiative of China. And education is a very important part. So in working with the B and uh, R countries, the Belt and Road countries, China develops this action plan. Okay, action plan. So there's some particular goals by the year 2020. So I'm going to elaborate on that. So first of all, uh, the first document, some opinions on strengthening educational open up in the new era. So in this document, uh, it laid out six major objectives by the year 2020. Okay. Uh, uh, first is to develop a sound service system for Chinese students abroad. You may wonder why. Okay, why? We need to have this, okay? Um, you know, when China uh, regained access in the world or trade organization, China committed to, you know, fully open up the education market, uh, especially in terms of students studying abroad. No matter where they like to go, no matter what they <coughs> like to study, they just feel free, okay? So we do not have any restrictions on students studying abroad. But then the government realized we have such a big increase of students <coughs> studying abroad ever since the year 2008. We are experiencing like a 20% increase each year of students studying abroad. 
then what can we do to bring them back? We do not want to suffer from the big brain drain. Okay? We need to attract them back. So in order to do that, we need you know, the, the talent to support you know, our own development. We're not paraphrasing students for all the countries. So the government this is a top strategy you know, to provide services during their study abroad and also especially after they complete their degrees or qualifications abroad and try to bring them back. Okay, uh, so uh, this is one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is the government is increasing the government scholarships for our students to study abroad. Okay, so how to manage the system of supporting financially our students to study abroad is also a question of concern for the government and for the ordinary people. For the ordinary people. And also, you know, especially for the students who study on government scholarships, what type of students, what levels do we, you know, are we looking for? Okay, this is also a problem that we need to be carefully thought about. Uh, so this topic, this uh, in the area, students study abroad becomes the top goal uh, objective in this policy. And the second is to improve the education quality for international students in China. You know, China's overall objective is to attract half a million international students by the year 2020. Half a million. So by this year, uh, the figure is somewhere around 470,000 international so it's very close to the goal of the year 2020. Okay? But if we look at the structure of those who are studying in China, you know, only 64% of them are studying for degrees. Okay? Uh, the rest are studying for placement, for languages. So we need to you know, look for more you know, degree education students, and also, uh, it is also uh, required by our government for the university to improve the overall standards, quality for international students. So, uh, international students uh, is also a big endeavor for our universities. Uh, you know, we have some, um, you know, uh, and the indicators to measure the internationalization of higher education and international students accounts for a big part of it. If you say, well, it is an internationalized university, then 10% of your students have to be international. Otherwise, you are only an interna internationalizing university. It's not an internationalized university. So to be internationalized, you have to at least 10% of your students international, okay? Uh, so, to improve the levels. Uh, the third is to improve the effectiveness of joint education. What do we mean by effectiveness? Okay, joint education, as I said, is uh, more taken as a capacity building and human resource development approach in this society, okay? Uh, previously, you know, it is very much on the numbers, uh, the quantity, but uh, how to make them more uh, you know, demonstrative, exemplary, or how they should serve as best practices for the national universities? Now, this is a big question. Okay. You know, as I said, the approach is to introduce quality education. But without the integration, without a local application of the international practices, how can we learn from them? Okay? So effectiveness means you know, how much we can really benefit from such endeavor. Uh, 
from the introduction of quality education, how the international element, the international standards, practice can be, you know, in harmony or even, uh, you know, be made it adaptable to the local context. So this is what I think about. So we try to introduce some, you know, a cluster of demonstrated or exemplary or best practices of joint education. Okay, so this is to improve the effectiveness of it. The fourth is to extend and deepen bilateral and multilateral educational cooperation. Of course, as we know, China is working with you know, countries, uh, not only in economy, but now mainly under the term of people, people, and cultural exchanges. Okay, people, and people. There are three pillars in China's diplomacy. One is strategic and political mutual trust, like in the case of Pakistan, China, brothers. Okay, uh, strategic and mutual trust, political trust. This is the first pillar. Second pillar, economic cooperation, economic and trade cooperation. And the third pillar is people to people and cultural exchanges. So these are regarded as the three pillars of China's diplomacy. You know, the BRICS are going to meet in Xiamen in the next couple of days. And you, if you look at the agenda, they also reflect these three pillars. If you look at the relation between China and Pakistan, you will come up to, ah, yes, the three pillars are there. Okay. Uh, previously, you know, um, in certain stage, is focus is very much on economic and trade in political side. People to people and culture is left behind it. So now we need to catch that up. We need to extend and deepen that through bilateral and multilateral uh, education and cooperation. Okay? Especially now multilateral. China is working with the international community on different levels. Country specific, region specific. Now I think you know mainly you know the multilateral platforms are very important. In the case of Pakistan, for example, uh, the one belt and one road initiative. Pakistan is you know, very central to that initiative. This is one scheme. Second scheme is China South Asia you know, framework. There's a framework of cooperation between China and the Southeast, South Asia countries. Right? So this is also a platform. Okay? Uh, and of course, country specific, China to Pakistan. In Africa, for example, in addition, you know, working with, you know, uh, the African Union, various countries, China is working with the whole continent under the under the framework of China Africa Cooperation Forum, FOCA, we call it. Okay, so uh, multilateral multilateral uh, uh, level is also a focus for Chinese diplomacy. So, and so it is with education. Uh, fifth is to increase the participation in international education governance. As you know, uh, in recent years, China's visibility in the world international politics is increasing. Okay? China is playing a more and more important role in international governance, especially ever since the international five crisis financial crisis, right? Like last year, G20 was hosted in Hangzhou. It greatly increases China's role in international governments. But what about the education? What China can do its part to contribute to international education development? What role can China play in leading the policy decisions, <coughs> policy coordinations in the world education sector? Uh, what can China do in the world education organizations like UNESCO? We are very less represented, uh, not as many as the developed countries. How China is taking the developing countries? Okay. 
worldwide to have their our own voices. So this, of course, very much uh, to the mind of the Chinese central government. Okay. So to part increase participation in international education governance. Sixth is to enhance the legal and standard system of education offered. So as an endeavor itself, internationalization needs to have its own system of management and standards because it's an endeavor full of risks. Okay? Full of risks. Okay. It's an endeavor that needs to be carefully managed. We do not want our students, faculty members, institutions to be injured. Okay? Um, by any incidents, by any diplomatic, you know, chaos sometimes. So uh, we need to develop a system to protect the interests of our students, faculties, <coughs> of those who are studying and working in China, and of course, of the whole endeavor uh, of internationalization. So these are the six major objectives, and also. Based on this, we have uh, laid down six. Yes, please. I'm sorry to cut you off, but this yeah. time, but probably this will be too late. Then, so no problem. No problem. Um, the first question I, mean, I have observed by people who call you as well is that you have to compare it to yourself. What, what is the criteria that they select their students for uh, in foreign policy? Um, I mean, because I have seen a bunch of schools in UK University, in the US University, how average. Chinese students are studying there. Mm -hmm. And uh, some part of um, self finances and some are in mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. scholarship. Mm -hmm. So, is there any mechanism laid down by I mean, how to select a capitated student for a scholarship? Yes, and, sure. and just uh, vice versa, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, how about the future of the recognition? Okay. Is there any mechanism as well? Oh, of course, of course. Um, we have a very uh, sophisticated and well established uh, mechanism for the government scholarships. For self-study, as I said, there is all yeah, yeah. Okay, no matter well, yeah, okay. every, you know, because uh, if you know, they uh, only when they are affordable, yeah. okay, then they can choose to study in whatever field, in whatever kind of field. But for government scholarships, you know, uh, we have a, a, a very strict process. We have a we call the China Scholarship Council, China Scholar CSC, China Scholarship Council. It's responsible for the selection of Chinese students that are abroad and also for international students that are in China on government scholarships, okay. CSC. So first, it's part of the Ministry of Education, but it's operating on its own. And the second, you know, it has a platform. You have to all apply online, okay? You have to submit uh, your study plans, okay? Uh, and then they have a group of experts Review, okay, uh, to review who is qualified for this, who is qualified for that. Uh, have a very rigid selection process, and of course, with the, for international students, usually they apply to you know, our embassy in your country or sometimes to your ministry of education. Okay, so there's a process. They, they need to be recommended rather than you know. Uh, uh, you know Choose by member. Okay, um, that's that's the you know the, the screening process. And the third, you know, we have some kind uh, some policies to guide uh, the areas and the, the levels. Yeah, now, you know, the majority of the students who study in China are government scholarships. All the Chinese students who study abroad have to be on a master's and doctorate level. So the higher, the better. The higher, the better, and the more they get scholarships. I mean, you know, they might get a much larger scholarship than others. So moving up to the high ends, high ends of that. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, again, to the next part of the, what you call is an internationalized university. Mm -hmm. The kind of students should be international. International, yes. So is there any, I mean, uh, one university is supposed to be established and then just work with a few that work for all and then just policy that okay in this year because we have this much facilities we can hire only this much of the uh, you know for a university uh, that is uh, authorized to recruit international students they have to meet the standards 
Okay, you know, we, usually we have several government departments will come to evaluate uh, <coughs> whether the their standards have been satisfied. Once they are satisfied and authorized, then they are able to uh, recruit their international students. Okay, and of course, now we have the, uh, the, uh, the, we call it the evaluation process uh, issued by the Ministry of Education. So they will come up to the university to be very whether their programs are good enough. Their programs are good enough to recruit international students. When their, if their <coughs> education is good enough to satisfy international students, when their services are good enough to support the international students. So we have an evaluation scheme developed by the ministry to ensure the quality. So, the universities can work on their own, but they have to meet the standards and they have to be evaluated by the government. May I go on? Yeah, I'll come up with more introductions of the student numbers, you know, the, uh, the procedures, and also you know, the main trends and the past uh, uh, yes. We need the technical staff. <laughs> so any other questions so far? <laughs> I'll be there. So whenever you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. So, okay. I have a question. Uh, the, the major, the dominant thing that I experience is that they appreciate diversity. Yeah, of course, this is international understanding. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the minimum. Yeah. That's the minimum. So that you can appreciate diversity. Diversity, yes. Yeah, sure. And you appreciate culture. Yeah, sure. Values. That, that's sure. This is, and of course, as I said, it's only part of international understanding. But the skills, are, you know, for us, it's on top of that. Yeah. You know, this, of course, you have this awareness. You, when we are talking about uh, cross-cultural communication skills. It is very much dependent, uh, uh, very much, uh, it very much depends on your cultural awareness of diversity, you respect each other, otherwise there's no real communication. Right. So um, it is, uh, you know, in, in the curriculum, in our uh, the development of uh, international understand, understand confidence, you can study in our primary school. Okay. And now, for example, in, in this province, uh, the Department of Education and our department has introduced a scheme for our primary schools and middle schools to work internationally. The key <coughs> objective is international understanding of confidence. Okay, it's just like numeracy, literacy, media literacy, science literacy. So international education, international understanding confidence is one important part of the yes. Thank you. May I continue? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, it has been noted that there is more emphasis on material sciences in China rather than on social sciences, especially the Pakistani scholars. Uh, one of my colleagues, he also told me about that. I think, I think your degree uh, of PhD in economics. Uh, economics. Yeah. Uh, he also admitted that uh, the standard in social sciences, especially in economics, that is not at par with other uh, countries of the world. And he also mentioned that some of the universities in Pakistan are better uh, in economics mm. than the Chinese universities. What's the reason that there is more emphasis on material sciences rather than on very some important subjects like economics? Uh, no such emphasis. Uh, I don't think I've uh, got uh, questions right. You mean uh, why? More of the science is there on material sciences. Material sciences? Social sciences. Social sciences. Uh, well, I, I, uh, I actually, you know, I've been working in university for many years, uh, for 25 years. Actually, you know, for me, we also have the, the, the greater 
the importance also is very much attached by the central government. In social sciences, for example, the Zhejiang Normal University is, is very strong in social sciences and communities. It ranks somewhere around the top five, uh, top fifty in the country. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, economics, of course, you know, uh, in cap comparison, relatively, uh, yes, we have some. Um, uh, you know, I think it's more because of the developmental stages, because China is, uh, you know, especially in the last. In the previous twenty years, it's developing so fast, you know, uh, and it it is mainly driven by, you know, trade, investment, science and technology. I think that's th this is might be one explanation why such a big emphasis is put on that. But on the other side, especially I think, especially after uh, you know President Xi Jinping took power, uh, it, it gave great emphasis to. Develop the social sciences. Many scholarships, many projects um, uh, have been actually developed. Have developed. So I, I do not, you know, quite see uh, the, the big difference as you are maybe observing. You know, I myself worked in the Zhejiang University, uh, and my field is mainly in, uh, in, in, in social sciences. So I do not personally see. A big difference, uh, but in some universities you might come up with that. For example, in in Zhejiang University, you know, which is merged between uh, you know, uh, previously very strong engineering university and also a university in medical sciences, a university in agriculture, and a university in social sciences and humanities. Uh, so four universities merged into one. There are some complaints. The university is too focused on the material sciences rather than the social sciences. So that a former part of the university of Hangzhou, which is very much social sciences focused, is somehow you know, neglected. Uh, this uh, you know, is something, uh, this is because you know, the universities care very much about their rankings. For social sciences, when you get a research uh, you know, fund, it's very limited. I mean, a small amount of money. But if you have a hard science project, it's usually several times larger. Okay? So the u universities are quite misled in that. Misled in that. The more fund that they have, research fund they have, the higher they might get into the university ranking. So they tend to work more on hard sciences. Okay, I try to put it in hard sciences, soft sciences. Okay, so because they are more, it's much easier for them to get funds first, and secondly, they might have much larger funding for the universities. Okay, for social sciences, usually, you know, a project, a typical project uh, of social science communities sometimes is you know, between 100,000 to like 300,000. But for, for example, a science and technology project, it could be millions. Okay, so that makes a difference for the universities. You know, when they are looking for funds to be you know, high in the ranking, okay? You know, and also uh, for the prices, you know, uh, every year we are, uh, in the universities, the scholars are competing for prizes, okay? And it, obviously there are far more prizes in the hard sciences than in social sciences, in business right. So they're certain, but as uh, you know, uh, a scholar in this field, I do not see much of a difference, especially I think now. Okay. Yeah. You were saying that in Zhejiang Normal University, it's very, very, they have a very good social science department, but the professors who we, we got interaction with and in Genoa, they themselves said that they, they don't have a very, very good social science department. 
they were all, and the two universities were exposed to them now. One was Vijayan University and the other actually was Chinua University uh, in Beijing. Chinua. Chinua University. Both, the, both universities were very strong in pure sciences, but as far as social sciences and humanities was concerned, they were nowhere near. They themselves admitted this. Okay, um, I worked as the assistant president to the Jamal University. I know they are. They, 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 were very good, they have a very good teacher's training program, yes. Yes, uh, and also they have some uh, uh, you know, very good programs, for example, in, uh, in the country specific studies. Yeah, in the that studies. is what the African study is. Also in uh, you know, critical sciences, critical science, in uh, literature, in um, you know, uh, it, because it's, sometimes it's, I think, it's a more perception of an individual. Like I specifically asked about literature. You I know. didn't get an answer because I'm, I'm a professor of literature. In okay, I know. So um, I specifically asked about the English department and, and then all that. They weren't, in fact, they didn't know about the English department. Okay. Um, you, know, you know, who determines that whether a good university, where this university is good in social sciences and the community? Who determined that? You know, uh, of course, we have. It, it is um, very much uh, decided by the number of, we call it the key, dis the key disciplines, the key disciplines, at the ministerial level, the province level. Okay, this is one <coughs> important fact. And the second, of course, we have the, the university rankings, the discipline rankings by our, uh, you know, specialized. Uh, institutions, okay, and the Zhejiang University ranks very high in social sciences communities. It's it's by a third party. It's not by the university itself. Uh, it's not by the university itself, but by a third party, professional party. Okay, uh, like Tsinghua University, of course, you have visited Tsinghua. Tsinghua is traditionally very strong in science and technology. It's relatively weak. I mean, within the university itself in social sciences. But in Zhejiang Normal, I think the social sciences, the humanities are much stronger than you know, the applied science of it, than the, the, the technologies. Right? So yeah, it's, it's more like you know, a person of Chanel. Maybe I think the professor that you have come up with, he or she, he or she doesn't agree with that. But according to the rankings, it's there, okay? uh, between 50 to 60 in the country. So it should be there. Uh -huh. first mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I'll go on. Uh, we'll come up with two more questions on that. So, task number one. Okay. Again, as I said, student and faculty mobility. So it very much explains what I'm saying. So in this document, you know, we say, "Ha! Huh, internationalization. We need to prepare five types of urgently demanded." talents in the country, okay? So it is very specific. Five categories, types of urgently needed talents. Uh, and uh, that is mainly through the government scholarships. What are these five types? First, okay, uh, talents that are capable of non-general languages, okay? non-general, non-universal languages. So that's number one. So languages plays a very important role. Okay? Talents for non-general international languages. Even, for example, in Africa, Swahili. Uh, okay? Udo, of course. Udo, of course, we have already a number of university offering program in Udo. And Udo is one of these you know, languages. This is number one. Second one is talents uh, that are capable of working in international organizations. Okay? Talents that are capable of working in international organizations. Because as I said, we are less represented in <coughs> international organizations. United Nations, UNESCO, or whatsoever. So we need more talents for that. Third is we call it excellent, innovative talents. Okay, 
anyway, China is moving more into uh, innovation-driven society. So we need a talents <coughs> for that. So excellent <coughs> innovation uh, talents. The fourth is talents for regional and country-specific studies. Okay, talents uh, for regional and country-specific uh, studies. Now, this is also interesting. Okay, so we're looking for experts. Okay, to prepare experts who, you know, could have you know can provide intellectual support to government decisions to the boundaries between countries. So that's uh, the third, uh, the fourth. The fifth is excellent international students, which means very top successful uh, international students. Okay, uh, those who can be political leaders, okay, leaders in innovation uh, or even entrepreneurs, etc. So these are the five types of urgently need to depounds. And this, of course, I also come to my colleague's question about the criteria of selections. This will be the, you know, the future directions are for government scholarships, government scholarships. To improve the working mechanism for studying abroad, to regulate an overseas studies market, and to improve the food chain management service system for overseas students. As I said, you know, students may feel free to study uh, where they would like or what they would like. But how to provide a support system for them? We have some services for overseas studies. Okay, we have some, we, we call it agencies for uh, study abroad. They might, you know, be driven by, you know, their intention to make more money from the students. But as government, so you have to protect the interests of the students to monitor such agencies of international studies or overseas studies. So that is... Uh, why we say to regulate the overseas studies market. Actually, these agencies are making an awful lot of money from the students. They, they charge very high you know, for uh, providing services to students study abroad. So the government wants to monitor the overseas <laughs> studies market. Uh, just to pick up again here, um, I have observed that some of the consultants are working inside China as well, mm -hmm. and they are assisting the international students. Mm -hmm. um, so the international students submit their form, they charge them about five hundred dollars, they pursue their applications, mm -hmm. and uh, I have seen some of the. Um, I mean, two months ago, uh, one of the consultants visited my university, and they, mm -hmm. they were trying to have some sort of deal with us so that they can send a graduate to China, to Chinese mm -hmm. university. And when I, I was astonished that uh, in the proposal they said that, okay, we can refine their uh, research proposals, mm -hmm. uh, which to me was very astonished because the research proposal is always need to be uh, finished by a student. Mm -hmm. And they were providing the services and they were costing, uh, charging the student for additional fees. Yeah. So this, this is, again, I mean, uh, we are going toward the dilemma that uh, mm -hmm. the standard will go down. So is the Chinese government is paying? Because, uh, they had a registered office here, yeah. and things are there, so is there any regulation going on there as well? Yeah, yes, so this is a big problem. We have already realized that. You know, many, uh, you know, service agencies actually are mani manipulating that, okay? Uh, they work on the universities, yeah. you know, to recruit students. Uh, actually, in their mind, they do not have criteria. They do not have students because only when they introduce one student, they will benefit from that. So their criteria is success, okay? Not quality, yeah. not quality. So that's why you know, the government says we need to regulate and monitor these you know, uh, agencies. agencies. <coughs> also, you know, this is for international students, 
For Chinese students abroad, we also have agencies, many, many agencies in that. Okay? They charge even much higher than for international yeah, students. Actually, it's more than that. You know, for international students that are abroad, first they charge our students and they, they, they then get, they get commission from the, university from the universities. Yeah. So they have double benefits. Okay, so uh, regulate the overseas studies market is a key problem. Uh, a second way is to improve the uh, education quality for international students and we, as well as the service management system and to build a brand of study in China. So this is the very first time that we uh, use the term study in China brand. Okay? Uh, the overall target of uh, the Chinese government is to make China one of the most favorable destinations for international students in Asia. Now, of course, the biggest market goes to the English-speaking countries. Yeah. To uh, to Europe, even now, to Japan, to South Korea, to Indonesia, to Singapore. Yeah, but the thing is, uh, um, uh, I've been teaching in three universities there, so yeah. I will get off my doctorate from the University of Leicester, then I've been teaching in Liverpool, Oak University, and then in Manchester. Mm -hmm. And I have seen Japanese students coming there as well, Korean coming there as well, because it's the language barrier. Yes. And, uh, which if they get a degree from the English-speaking country, mm. uh, this increases their marketability in the, their whole country. Mm -hmm. You know, um, well, of course, China is also developing programs taught in English. Okay, Zhejiang University, even Zhejiang Normal University, they have programs taught in English, because uh, you know, it, Chinese, the, the uh, Chinese language is a bit difficult to learn. But once you start it, then you will go into that. So uh, to avoid this problem, okay, so a wide range of universities have developed programs in, in English. Undergraduate, postgraduate studies. So students can come for English education in China now. Yeah. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new trend. So anyway, uh, China wants to compete <coughs> with, you know, well, it's, sometimes it might be difficult to compete with the uh, United States which is now more than 1 million students last year, okay? Uh, 1 million international. The first year that they exceed uh, with more than 1 million international students. Uh, we want to have half a million by the year 2020. Uh, in Japan, of course, they have also developed some hard goals. Uh, their uh, target is for uh, 300,000 uh, 300, students by the year 2020. So they're competing also for international students. Why? First, human resources. Second, economic benefits. <coughs> Third, as we said, international standing. You have international networks, okay? International ne uh, networks. So many universities have developed their own strategy to recruit international students. Like in Singapore, in Malaysia, Indonesia, they have been introducing you know, world-renowned universities to run branch campuses, but their main purpose is to recruit international students. Singapore is the case. Malaysia is also the case. Yes, why is it? I mean, that the hard place you have seen, you can see the way the American universities and uh, you know, Canadian universities in Dubai. Um, yeah. What I'm, uh, of course, probably is the discussion is going on. Yeah, sure. Uh, last, on the way back in Shanghai Airport, we went to uh, yeah. France with uh, PhD students. And she was doing a PhD in English. Yeah. And that was surprising for me <laughs> because it's almost difficult to move around in the city with, uh, with people hardly ever speak English. And uh, she was coming. So, what is the criteria for starting a program? Like in Pakistan, we have compulsion. You cannot start a program if you don't have a full, full, full time PhD faculty member there. And so, I mean, is there any criteria here as well? Because oh, of course, there is a criteria, as I said. You know, for any university, you know, in order to uh, different levels, of course. Once you start to recruit undergraduates, of course, it's evaluated, okay. Uh, and once you want to recruit the masters or doctorate degrees, it's very much to the professors. But for the undergraduates, it's usually the government obligation to evaluate whether they are you are eligible for that, whether they are already qualified. 
But for masters and for uh, you know doctorate degrees, it's usually very much the the professor. And what is the limit for a professor? Like in Pakistan, I can only supervise five PhD students. What 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 criteria does the professor set? Um, language, of course. It very much depends on the the language competence of the professor himself. If he doesn't speak in English, how he could take students uh, in English? That the limit of students. English many is a different thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. so uh -huh. You will have to be proficient in English in order to, uh, to teach English, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. English is a different thing. For example, in engineering or in other, in other faculties, in other social sciences, what is the criteria of the professor? What criteria does, minimum criteria, that the professor would set? Uh, usually it's an, entry, uh, it's an examination, it's, uh, uh, you know, for, of course, for a um, teacher to be, uh, you know, uh, a supervisor for master's degree students, it's not an easy thing, okay? You need to have a degree, you need to have uh, a title, professional title, usually associate professor. Usually you for a lecturer, it's less likely you will be a supervisor for masters. For a doctorate a degree supervisor, usually you have to, on a doctorate degree, you have to be a professor, you have to have research project. Without this, you are not eligible for it. And my question is again, how, what is the limit on the professor? How many students, PhD students you can Then uh, I think, uh, well, uh, it, it again, it also depends on the teacher himself. Okay, you know, uh, for, you know, in some cases, in some cases, for some of the process, professors I know, maximum five, okay, for especially for the doctorate degrees, five, no more than that. Mm -hmm. For uh, a part, uh, 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 masters, like a dozen, that's a maximum. But for some, well, 20, yeah, and there is a degree so, in Europe as well, if a professor is having more than 100 impact factors, mm -hmm. then he can take more than 5 students. Mm -hmm. But if his impact factor is less than 100, mm -hmm. then he is restricted to only 5 students. Mm -hmm. yeah. We also have restrictions. Yeah, so restrictions. But otherwise, you know, quality is not assured. And we also have restrictions. Uh, and they also, you know, once you decide, you have to uh, ask the university for approval to publish science. Okay, if you do not have that plan, the quota, then you cannot take in students. Okay, so you have to publish that quota a year before. Okay, and it has to be confirmed by the university. Also, is there an entrance test like a GRE kind of a thing? Or I'm sorry? Is there, is there an entrance test kind like a GRE kind of a thing? Or a, uh, GRE. GRE, like the American GRE. GRE, yes. yes. Uh, here is more like a not, not a very, it's only for languages. <coughs> HSA. HSA. Tai Yu That is the Chinese proficiency test. HSA. But for a, for a student of English, for example, do you need to know HSK too? No, no, no. HSK is only for Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> HSK is only for Chinese, not for English. It's uh, okay. So there, there are some standards there. It's, uh, it, it does not mean that we're selling you know, uh, the, the degrees. It's more like um, uh, you know, some, we, we call it the degree meal uh, plants, the degree meals uh, in the Western societies. I get the question when you come to the quality. Mm -hmm. so the, 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 I have mostly seen the criteria that we have, I mean, a week ago I met one of my PhD students in Beijing, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, And I observed that his major contribution, he has only a single major contribution in his thesis, mm -hmm. and he will get a PhD degree. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Europe and America, mm -hmm. you need to have three major contributions mm -hmm. before you submit to a PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. So is, again, you have got, we in, uh, uh, in Europe and America, as well as now in Pakistan, we are not considering only uh, in the 10th level a master level thesis if it doesn't have a substantial true contribution. Mm -hmm. I mean, he will get a degree, a PhD degree, where in other countries you cannot even get a fellow. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So that is, uh, I mean, that was a dilemma for me because so, 
Uh, being uh, he was getting going to get a degree in computer software <coughs> engineering, mm -hmm. and his major work was just a literature review. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was no substantial contribution. Mm -hmm. So uh, how the theses are evaluated? Then? I mean, mm -hmm. we uh, have adopted to an American system. Mm -hmm. we, we send the PhD thesis to the <coughs> developed countries, and mm -hmm. one of the two renowned professors of the developed countries they do they give comments on it. And one of the local in within Pakistan, mm -hmm. the field expert will also give. And after that, a decision will be made whether mm -hmm. this he, uh, he, he is entitled to be given a doctorate degree or not. And after that, there is a public defense as well. Well, um, I think China has not come to that stage yet, yeah, to be honest. So really. that, to be honest, because I was surprised. You know, it's, uh, we have not come up to that stage yet. We have some. You know, uh, you know, I myself got uh, a PhD from Zhejiang University. You know, uh, if I do not have contributions, then I could not get a degree. Yeah. And like I have a, a student in my, my cohort, an Australian student. Okay, it's a, a Australian Chinese. Uh, he, uh, she actually did the dissertation, excellent, excellent dissertation, but he did, she didn't have one single uh, contribution. But still, she has not got a degree yet. So she needs to have two contributions in order to get the degree. So uh, it, again, contribution, I mean, that's you know, uh, just for take it for example, you know, uh, you know, basically, you know, China has not come to that stage yet. We're not talking about the U.S. We're talking about, not about the United Kingdom, who has a scholastic system for you know hundreds of How years. How do you evaluate like a PhD doctoral thesis? How do you get pieces of uh, Usually, it's, you know, usually, you know, uh, this is, you know, not much to the, the you know, to the, the, but I can answer that. Usually, it's sent out, you know, for peer reviews, five peer reviews, <coughs> peer reviews. It's the supervisor and the student has no idea where they, it will go. The university has a, you know, database. Okay. It's choose automatically, okay? and send it to the five professors for, for review. So when uh, four of them has a positive remark, then you, can, you are eligible for the oral defense. We have a very rich you know, oral defense in a book panel. Okay? Usually it's five. Uh, you know, the, the oral defense uh, judges, they're also taking from this database so, you, so that you are not prepared. Who will be sitting there <coughs> for your oral defense? So you have to, uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 it, and also, you know, quality, I think, basically differs from country to country. There's no uni criteria. And secondly, even within the system <coughs> itself, universities differ from each other. For example, Zhejiang University has, of course, honestly, a much higher criteria than Zhejiang Normal, because anyway, it's a world-renowned university. So their standards is much higher. So it's, it's uh, of course, uh, this is the reason why the government is focused on... Think, is it okay? It's another question. Do, do you have a regulatory authority which controls all the universities, whether they are... Uh, a what? Do you have a regulatory authority, like we in Pakistan have a higher education commission, mm -hmm. the regulatory authority that regulates all the universities, mm -hmm. all the private and public sector universities. Do you have a kind of regulatory We, we uh, it's, it's more to the, we, we do not have a buffer body like in your case, the Higher Education Council. We are more to the government, uh, the Ministry of Education. Okay, that is Higher Education Commission in Pakistan too. Mm -hmm. the ministry, it's a government organization, mm -hmm. it's under the Ministry of Education. But it is the controlling authority of all the universities. It, 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 it gives us the parameters to, uh, like for example, judging how do we evaluate a PhD thesis. And that is same for everybody. Mm -hmm. Every university in Pakistan has to follow that. Mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, uh, countries differ from each other, but not all the countries have, you know, like the university councils. But in here, you know, we, we, we have, a, it's a more centralized country, okay? It has its own uh, features. Uh, I guess I said it's more to the, the government. You know, for example, higher education is very much uh, the responsibility of the provincial government, while primary, secondary education is very much the priority, the, uh, 
uh, capacity of the, the local uh, government. So for the, the quality assurance uh, mechanisms, you know, it's usually developed by the government itself. It's not by the university councils in this country. So it's different from Pakistan. No, it's, very, it's very same, actually, because in Pakistan, too, it is the government who ensures the quality. Yeah. The yes, sir. I was talking about, it is, it is the government. Mm -hmm. It is, again, very centralized. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has the final say. Yeah, we do not have this council. We do not have this uh, higher education council. It's the government itself. It's right in the front. Okay? Yeah? Okay. All right. So again, uh, the study in China uh, brand. Okay, thank you for interesting questions. Okay. Um, so one of the most favorable destinations in, uh, in Asia, in Asia, um, not at this moment to say in the world, but in Asia. Okay. And then program and uh, the task two is program and institution mobility. Um, Sign of foreign cooperative education. Uh, we have the market access. As I said, we do not allow branch campuses. We, at this moment, we do not allow uh, cross-border uh, delivery of higher education through online education, through virtual education. It's not allowed because we're not sure. We're not sure the quality. So we have to wait and see. Wait and see. So market access is there, it's very clear. So as you want to deliver a joint education and so as your quality is good enough, then you can apply. But we do not have a system to retreat, okay? Once a degree is outdated, once a degree uh, is not favored by the students, then you have to retreat. So we do not have a system for that. So that's why they uh, want to develop a system for and secondly, the approval process. Traditionally, all the applicants has, have to go to the Ministry of Education to decide. Of course, it is evaluated by a panel. So previously, I sat on the panel to review all the applicants or the feasibility of the joint education programs. And once the panel said yes, the government would say yes. But to reform that means to decentralize that. For example, this province is the fir first province in the country uh, which has its final say to say, we want to introduce a project instead of going to the ministry. Okay? So the province, province is authorized to decide and so on what programs, especially on the undergraduate level, uh, to introduce as a joint education program. To carry out evaluation and accreditation, as you know, um, the quality of our degree programs are very much assured through evaluation. Government organized evaluation. We, have, we don't have a system of accreditation. But in this joint education sector, uh, the, Chinese, the, the central government says, we want to introduce <coughs> the quality assurance through accreditation. So the Shanghai Municipal Government is the authority that is empowered by the Ministry of Education to experiment, to run pilot <coughs> projects on accreditation. Okay, now they have developed a full scheme of accreditation for international joint education programs. And now it is carried out through our National Association for International Exchanges and Cooperation. They are responsible for the accreditation of joint edu education programs, joint education institutions inside China. And of course, for some of the joint programs, uh, since it is between one Chinese university and one university <coughs> in the UK and US, or in even Germany, this program is also eligible for accreditation by foreign accreditation organizations. So, uh, carry out evaluation and accreditation. All right. So this is uh, for sign of foreign cooperative education. Uh, 
We also encourage our higher education institutions to run programs and institutions abroad. And especially in cooperation with enterprises. That's an interesting point. Uh, we are still very much limited in such this kind of uh, international practices. Only a very few number of uh, universities are running programs abroad. Like Zhejiang University is now running a branch campus in Imperial College in London. In London. Uh, uh, very limited, very limited. But they mainly run by themselves. Run by themselves. But as the government, they are encouraging our enterprises to be part of the stakeholders there, uh, to support the universities for this kind of efforts. Okay, of course, this is a, a policy guidance. And the third is to improve the quality of Confucius Institutes uh, to support the inclusion of Ch the teaching of Chinese language into the national education systems. By this we mean Chinese is a language that could be teach as a foreign language in the secondary education system or even in the primary education system. Okay, uh, so it's it's like in English. Okay. All the students are required to learn English from grades primary three, grade three in the primary school. But in reality, the majority of schools introduce English ever since grade one in primary. And for some in the cities like Hangzhou, even in kindergartens, English is taught. Is taught. But as a law, as a regulation, you know, all the students have to start to learn English from grade three in primary school. But of course, uh, as you rightly point out, many Chinese are still very limited in English. Our language, our English classes, English teaching is mainly for examinations. Okay, uh, for examinations. So the efficiency of foreign language teaching is still very low. Uh, but for the younger generation, things will be completely different. So if you come to some, you know, kids in the cities, then they are fluent in English. Uh, fluent in English. Uh, Confucius Institute directors institute and online Confucius institutes. Now even online Confucius institutes have uh, been developed. Uh, encourage participation by enterprises. Okay, so especially uh, when you are developing Confucius to abroad, you know, our enterprises who are uh, investing abroad are encouraged to be part of it. To be part of it. Should we take a break? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, a short break. All right.